Mike Cooley, and Miles Resch. Lord, we uh, continue to pray for Patsy Kern and Sandy Royer and Shirley Jordan. And we continue to lift up the, the son of Tara and her family and Terry Bacon. And Lord, we also lift up those that are, that are dealing with COVID and uh, many are not as affected so severely uh, it seems anymore, but Father, it's still it's still something that is it just doesn't go away, and uh, uh, it can affect people in a, in a harsh, more harsh way and with their health. Father, we just uh, do lift up the grooms as they deal with that. Uh, they seem to be on the other side of that, but uh, Father, we uh, lift them up to you. And anyone else who is not mentioned, who is on our hearts and minds, Father, you know what all of these are dealing with what all is going on, the situations, you know them well. And Father, uh, those that uh, even the rest of us don't know, that are in our hearts and minds, that are unspoken, we, we lift up the, the unspoken prayers, the unspoken people that are, that are in our lives, that need you. And Lord, this nation needs you. It needs you now more than ever. This is a year uh, coming, starting tomorrow, will be an election year. Father, and that just in many ways drives us crazy. Father, may we see your wisdom. Uh, may we see uh, seek your guidance in all of it and uh, uh, be able to uh, discern the truth that will help guide us and make decisions that will glorify you. Father, we, we thank you for all of this. And we thank you ultimately for your son who you sent to die for our sin. Father, there is no greater gift, and we continue to celebrate this gift in this season. That Christmas is not over just because December 25th has passed. We are still in the season. May we continue to celebrate the birth of our Lord on into the new year. And Father, He is the reason for the whole year for us to celebrate. Father, we thank you, and we come together. Uh, as one body with one voice saying the words that he taught his disciples
your prayer this morning. Father, we have sinned and caused separation in our closeness to you and others. Shine light on the sins that we need to confess. Father, we thank you for uh, forgiveness that comes when we confess, and we know that we are forgiven through Christ our Lord. It is, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our assurance this morning. We have assurance like David and the hero. Father, I confess all my sins to you, and stop trying to hide on my guilt. I say to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me all my guilt to all. Praise God for our forgiveness through Christ. Like a baby just fell from the sky, that would hurt. He wasn't created with a magic wand or in a science lab. Jesus was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was from the tribe of Judah and the house of David. He had in his family tree mothers with strange stories like Amars and amazing stories like Ruth's and sad stories like Bathsheba's. Jesus was a real Jewish boy, born into a real Jewish family with a real genealogy, full of real promises and real 
real people and real problems. Jesus was just like us. And he was unlike us. That's how things work when you are God and man. Jesus was born like boys and girls are. Born, but his birth was unlike any before it or since. Mary and Joseph were engaged to be married, but before they had even had even been a wedding, Mary was pregnant. This didn't seem right. So Joseph had a plan to quietly break up with Mary. But before he could do that, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She's not done anything wrong. The child within her is from the Holy Spirit. If that weren't enough to make Joseph the carpenter drop his hand on his big toe, the angel had more to say. Mary is going to have a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Things were about to happen that people had hoped to see happen for a long time. Centuries earlier, the prophet Isaiah predicted that a virgin would have a son, and he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. In other words, a young woman with an earthly way, with no earthly way to be pregnant, would give birth to a heavenly child. And Joseph woke up and did everything the angel told him to do. Mary had a son, and they named him Jesus, which means the Lord saves, which was the perfect name for a perfect Savior and a perfect new beginning for the story God had been writing for even, even before the first beginning, the beginning of time. And I wanted to, you know, isn't that a good story, account of, of Jesus? And it is, we have a new beginning coming, starting tomorrow, right? And a new year tomorrow, starting a new year. Anything, anything, sometimes we make resolutions, which means you're going to do something new in the new year, and anything you decided. All you get some calendars. Yeah, but we already have them. You already have them? Okay. Well, it's exciting to, to go into a new year, right? Because there's, there could be anything new coming. And yet it is also another day, just like any other day. But we are getting closer to when there will also be a new start when Jesus comes back again, right? Yeah. So we're excited about that. But it is exciting. It is exciting to see a new year, 2024. I'm getting older. But praise God for each new day and each new year, right? Because of what he's done for Jesus. And we can continue to celebrate Jesus. But let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you've done, for sending Jesus, for, for Mary, for Joseph, for uh, even... Elizabeth, Zechariah, all these people that you've chosen to use in this great, great story, this history, that is true. And Father, we thank you for these children that get so excited around Christmas, and even, even a little excited about New Year's, even though that means it's time to go back to school. Father, we do pray a blessing upon them as they go back again to school. And Lord, we ask that you continue to stir their hearts for you, and that we as parents in the church continue to teach them your word and your way. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Son, 
and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The sense of days
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're, uh, like I said, less than, uh, uh, almost 12 hours away from a new year, from 2024. Uh, 2020, you know, we're supposed to be driving these things that fly in the air by now. <laughs> so ridiculous. But anyhow, it's a new year. We have, you know, we have a lot. We have a lot coming. Uh, we have uh, a lot of work to do. We, we're, uh, you know, as we all have been anticipating, we are planning, God willing, to be uh, erecting a building, a church building this year. You know, I know it's been, it's been, you know, I probably said the same thing last year around this time, but this year we, you know, again, God willing, we will be starting, and uh, you'll start to see some things happening in March. And as that, that means there's work. And, uh, you know, and again, it's been, it's been a long time coming. Um, and I have only experienced part of what you all have experienced. Um, so, you know, it is, it is, it is something that is, it is at the forefront of all of our minds. But I, you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I truly believe that is one reason, a very big and good reason, why we need to study on resting. <coughs> you know, I know we're in an area that knows how to work. We know how to get things done. We know how to do work. But do we know how to rest? And because there is so much work that needs to be done, work that, that, that we will need to do, we also will need to rest. And we'll need to rest well. We need, we need to Sabbath well. And that, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat, it's, it, it, you know, this is somewhat, this will be good for me to get a better understanding of Sabbath, and I think it will be good for every one of us to get a better understanding of that. Um, and this resting or even grasping this may be one of the hardest things that we do this year because we are so intent on getting this going and getting things done, the work. Now, this morning, the passage I chose in Matthew is from his gospel. And, uh, I'm using this as kind of a transition from coming from uh, you know, the Advent season and now we're moving into a new year, a new focus, and uh, to get our minds start, starting to think on this study that we're going to look at for the next couple of months. And this, this passage here in Matthew 11 does, does not give any like specific area as to where Jesus is or what he, where he's teaching. Uh, it doesn't really say that he's speaking to any particular group of people. It seems that he's just generally talking to the crowd. And he has just finished condemning two cities that were largely unrepentant through his ministry within them. Uh, and now he moves into this invitation to come to him. And he, he first prays to the Father. We see a short prayer here in, the, in, in verse 25 where he says, Thank you, Father, uh, Lord of heaven and earth, that, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Jesus thanks God the Father not for not revealing these things to the wise and understanding. Now we just went through Proverbs on, in our Bible study and we saw how his wisdom is what we see. So what, what is he talking about here? Now, this is the wise and understanding of the world. God has kept things from them. And, and it says, and Jesus says here that he's revealed them to children. Now, Jesus claims that God makes things clear to children. Uh, you know, what exactly might that mean? You know, it, really, should I have just gone to the children instead of going to a Bible college and seminary? That would have saved me a lot of time. Maybe. A little slow of learning. But it would have saved me a lot of money, maybe, unless these children started a lot. But anyhow, I mean, this really has... It's not about, it's not a, a literal understanding where children know more 
than the, the older people. This has to do with humility, the humility, the innocence, so to speak, of a child. And, and God gives grace. We know that God gives grace to the humble. He reveals things to the humble. We just saw how God used the humble in the account of Jesus' birth. Mary was humble. The proud will not receive this grace. And God has chosen to reveal things <coughs> excuse me, to those He's chosen to reveal things to those that are like little children. Worldly wisdom will never understand the things of God. Knowledge of God comes from God and is given to whom he chooses to give it to. And we see, we see this in, in Jesus, what Jesus says here, that it is God's gracious will. This is, for, this is his will to do so. God gives grace to whomever he chooses. And we've seen that before many places in Scripture. And we, uh, it, it is a truth that comes from God's Word. It is what God's Word says. And God favors certain people to do his will. We just saw this with Zechariah and Elizabeth and with the conception of John the Baptist. We saw it with Mary and her conception. There, there are many more accounted for in Scripture. And this is, this is really how God works. And then Jesus goes into talking about this relationship with the Father, between him and the Father. He's, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, he says. And Jesus was given authority by the Father. And Jesus is now speaking to this intimate relationship between him and the Father. <clears throat> what does that want to go away? And this is pointing to the close father-son relationship where things are passed on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Things were passed on from a father to a son. And Jesus is the Son of God, and that's what's being pointed out here. There is, there is a bond, there is knowledge, there is a relationship between a father and a son, even from a human standpoint. There's this relationship that nobody else can really know. And then he goes on and says, it talks about how no one knows the Son except the Father. He continues with saying that, you know, people only knew Jesus if he revealed himself, what he would reveal himself. But people know him only by his human nature and why, while he was here in that way, but they didn't fully and can't and couldn't fully know him like the Father. There is this, this uh, you know, the, the God-man aspect, well, both aspects of this person of Christ that we cannot know, we cannot fully understand. They didn't understand. We don't understand it. And then he, said, and then he goes on and he goes the other way as well. Is no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Father uh, in, in the way that the Son does. It is through Jesus that, that the Father is even revealed. And this is truly the only way that anybody can know God the Father. Jesus, when he was uh, revealing himself to Thomas, after Thomas doubted and said he had to you know, see and touch for himself, Jesus came to them again and he says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, if you had known me, you would not have known my Father also. So the Father and the Son, by knowing, the only way to know the Father is through the Son. And the Father knows the Son as well. And, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal the Father. So here's again this choosing, this idea of Jesus choosing this time. And again, you know, this choice is made by Jesus, who is God. And he reveals the Father, who is also God. And I know that not everyone agrees with, you know, this choosing of God, of people. We like to believe that we do have a choice, and we do have choices within this. So it gets a little bit, it gets heavy, and I'm not going to go too deep into that. But the Bible does teach that God chooses whomever he chooses. 
And I also know uh, that this brings up further implications of how things work throughout God's salvation history, how his redemption story, how this works within that. God, in, in, in the very real, full aspect of it, God is God and we are not. So we are not going to understand this fool. And, and then and he moves on then. The next couple of verses kind of seem to go in a different direction. And they're, they're the ones that I really want to use to focus on this morning to kind of make this transition into what we're going to study in this coming year. Jesus then said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He says, he, he's saying, come to me. This, this seems to be a call here for people that, that make the decision for themselves to come to Jesus. And this is what we look at and we say, well, we have this choice. People do choose to come, but listen to what John says, or how John wrote in John 6, 37. Jesus is saying these words, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Those that are his will come. And again, that's, this is heavy stuff. It's, it's deeper theological thinking. But um, it's something that the Bible does teach. That God, through Christ, chooses whom he chooses. This, this can be taken in the context of already being one of his people here as well. Like Jesus saying, come to me, to his people, us, Christians. Uh, he's saying, come. And you know, we know fully as Christians that we do uh, struggle with being weary, with being burdened, with being weighed down by things of this world. There are things that happen to us that are heavy. And he's saying, come. Christians are weary. Everybody has burdens, no matter who you are. No one is exempt from this. We know that. And then Jesus says take, to take his yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you. And you know, he says to take his yoke upon him. What in the world does that mean? What is, what is a yoke? And, uh, in this sense of speaking, it's, it's this piece of wood that joins two great animals, two maybe oxen or something like that, at the neck so they can work together as a team. Pulling something or dragging something, and uh, so this this is obviously figurative here. It's not we're not connecting ourselves with a piece of wood to Jesus, but this is used figuratively. So he and he, then he moves on after saying about taking this yoke. He says, "Learn from me." And the word here is the same word that is used for disciple. So we're to be one of his disciples, to learn, a disciple learns from the teacher. He, you know, he carried the burden of life in his humanity, and he knows, he knows how to do it right. He was the perfect human. And this is part of following Jesus. We, we are to do what he did, do what he taught. He taught how to carry his burdens, to carry the burdens, and he will, uh, in a very real way, Help us to carry our burdens as well. And he, more than help us. And I'll get to that in a moment. And then he, he goes on and he says that he is gentle and lowly in heart. He is, he's a gentle and humble teacher. Both of these words have really a humility in them. And I, I don't know, and hopefully all of us have had a teacher that has had these sort of um, uh, teaches this way. <laughs> when I think of it, I think of Pastor Daniel here recently uh, for me, where it, you know I spent five years with him, closely uh, working and, and kind of being mentored by him. And even though he is very knowledgeable and, and real, really smart uh, it, and experienced in ministry, he would he would teach with such grace and gentleness, never, never, you know treating me as though, well, you should know this. You know what I mean? He was gentle and had grace and would just help me to understand certain things, never, never telling me to go figure it out on my own. 
And I think that's that's important. There there are some that teach that way. Maybe some of us here have felt that way. You know, I don't really many times see this as teaching, though. Um, when I was, when I started at uh, a large company in New York working, uh, doing HVAC, um, I would say I had the experience of a pretty bad teacher. Um, and maybe we, maybe we don't look at our jobs as, as teaching, but if someone is learning under you or being you're being you're training someone, you are you are teaching them. You, they're being taught, and uh, that is what it is. We're all teachers in some way, many times. And I, I was working for this company, and um, I was in the residential department, but it didn't it wasn't working. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't working because I didn't talk. And I know that's a big surprise. I may have said this before. But, you know, they, I don't think they felt that they inspired me for not talking. So, you know, I, and this is just my opinion. I look back and I'm like, this, things are really weird here. But anyhow, they put me in another department. And they, they assigned me to help this guy who I'm pretty sure was the biggest jerk in the company. Um, it was in the, the commercial end, uh, so we were going on to bigger job sites and, you know, working just with other people that are working there. Um, so I, I, was, I was still very new at all of this and uh, think, doing these things, and I had a lot to learn. Uh, but the very first morning in the van, I get in the van, this is the first time I meet this guy. He says, I don't take break, I don't take lunch, and I work till 3.30. <laughs> He said, I don't, I'm not going to say what he said. I don't care. I'm going to make it nice, take it down. I don't care what you do. There was adjectives there. And, you know, this is great, right? First day, the first time I meet this guy, he's, he's, a, he's a jerk. And we get to the job site, and he takes me to a room, and it was an electrical, I think it was like an electrical room. Um, and then we, there needed to be a thermostat. I did control, so we needed, they, there needed to be a thermostat on the wall. Easy enough. But the wire needed to be a metal conduit. And so it had to go from one part of the room to the near the unit or to connect it to the unit. Well, I mean, I had never ran metal conduit or bent. <coughs> so this takes a special tool. It's been, you have to know how to measure it. You have to bend it with a tool. And I had no idea that. Let me tell you, there were couplings, couplings joined pieces together. And, you know, you can put them where you need them. But I think I used just about all the couplings. <laughs> and it, it was bad. And so, you know, and the thing was, I did this, but it, you know, there was no instructions. He didn't give me any instructions. It was just go and do it. And then I got, you know, it wasn't done right, so I was reprimanded for not doing it right, and I was made to do it again. And this time I had to ask the electrician how to do things. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was, I was about done. I, I, I think they were trying to get me to quit, and they almost got me to. And the, the experience was miserable. And, you know, he wasn't, I would say he was a terrible teacher. It, it, I guess that's a way of teaching. I was going to learn how to do something, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the best way to teach. He was just throwing me in, like, like throwing somebody into a pool who has never swam and saying, swim. Uh, that's not really teaching. You know, I, I, I see that as really a terrible way to learn. But, and you know, the other side is a, hum, a gentle and humble teacher they, and that person will explain and tell experiences of how to do something, maybe telling you, well, you know, you can go down that way, but I've, I've learned this, or I, you know, this way is better, and just explaining things. There's, you know, there is a time for a learner, for somebody learning to go and do, but, you know, at first, they really need to be taking it in. And Jesus didn't just tell his disciples to go and do that, that would have been terrible. He lived life with them. He was here for uh, years before he sent them out. 
he showed them how to do this life and what, who he was and lived with them. And the, the result of this teaching of learning from Jesus, he says, is rest for the soul, coming to him and learning from him results in the rest of the soul. And this, this, is, this is really all kind of counterintuitive. Jesus is talking about, he says, take his yoke, which is work, and it's <coughs> through this work that you find rest. You know, just look at another, another scripture that kind of speaks to this. It's Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. That there's a right path or a right way to live. The right path is the way of God and His Word. Soul rest is found in the right direction. It is living in obedience to what God has commanded. And then this goes back again to the scripture that we were referenced in John 14, where Jesus said that he is the way. He is the path to follow. And he is that way to soul rest. And God did come as a human, in, in the form of a human, as Jesus, and as an example. And otherwise, Jesus could have just come down and died on the cross and rose from the dead and went back to his place at, at God's right hand in the heaven. God is the greatest teacher. Jesus then says something that, that, Jesus, that doesn't logically make sense. It's, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <coughs> Again, he speaks to this yoke. And when we think of a yoke being carried, we don't think uh, of the word easy. Because carrying anything isn't necessarily easy unless you, you're trying to be manly. You know? <laughs> now, you know, because us men, when we, we like to present ourselves as strong and able to do things, and many times express that carrying something is easy. We're, we're constantly trying to prove ourselves, and I'm not sure who to, but oh, we got to do this. We don't like to be seen as weak. And that's okay. It's just who we are. And, and you know, that's a whole other subject that we're not going to go down that road this morning. But, you know, how can a burden be light? How can Jesus say that his burden is light? If, if we had to carry the burden that Jesus carried here on this earth, it would be unbearable. We couldn't carry that. He experienced the withdrawal of the Father on the cross. He experienced the punishment for sin. That is an unbearable burden. And Jesus took that burden upon himself, and because he paid our debt, we have rest for our souls. His burden is as much rest as our sin burden was the heaviest work. Soul rest comes in the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This right standing, being made right is the yoke of Jesus. Jesus' yoke is not burdensome or heavy to carry. And also looking at our burdens of this life, he can carry our burdens. And that, that is a different aspect. And so many of us are, are weary and tired. And so many of us don't rest well when we do rest. We just continue to struggle through each day with burdens weighing us down. And this life does have so many burdens. It brings weariness. And it's not easy. And we are we are really in need of rest. We need physical, mental, emotional, and, and spiritual rest. And that's hopefully what we what we get an understanding of in these next <coughs> couple of months when we look at the Sabbath. The Sabbath is resting. I think we get that, but it's, it goes deeper than and most likely when you, when you hear the word Sabbath, you do think of the stoppage of work. And there's a reason that God rested uh, on the seventh day in creation, when he created in six and rested on the seventh. Um, 
he wasn't tired. It, it was for our example. It was it was a pattern for humanity to follow. You know, I really want all of us to to prepare ourselves, even starting this week, and start asking ourselves how well how well do I rest? Because when we're if we if we if we think about Jesus inviting us to come and share the yoke, his yoke. When he's helping us carry our burdens, it's not like we're going 50-50 on this. Jesus is really carrying the load. We're just connected. And that's, that's where it's at when we're dealing with things in life. He is the one carrying the burden. And I want us to think, as we prepare for this study, that how, how well... How well do we rest? And when, when we're coming to Jesus to find rest for our souls, and, and thinking of it practically even in the idea of Sabbath keeping, how well do we rest? What do we call rest? What is, what is it that we do or don't do that is rest? Are we relying on Christ to do, to do his part, or are we trying to do it in our own strength when we do do the work? And we do, we do need rest in order to do his work, is the whole thing. Our productivity, our uh, doing things well, even in, within the church, comes from resting well. And I know that's hard to, it's hard to, to think about, but uh, there's a little illustration here that I want to say. It's not mine. But according to Greek legend, in ancient Athens, a man noticed the great storyteller Aesop playing childish games with some little boys. He laughed and jeered at Aesop, asking him why he wasted his time in such frivolous activity. Aesop responded by picking up a bow, loosening its string, and placing it on the ground. He said to the critical Athenian, Now answer the riddle, if you can. Tell us what the unstrung bow implies. The man looked at it for several moments, but had no idea what the point Aesop was trying to make. Aesop explained, if you keep a bow always bent, it will break eventually, but if you let it go slack, it will be more fit for use when you want to use it. And, and people are also like that. that. That's why we all need to take, we really need to take time to rest. In the Old Testament, God set a pattern when he created and rested from his work. So shouldn't we take his example seriously and start, start by setting aside a special time to, to relax, to rest physically and renew ourselves emotionally and spiritually. Uh, you will be at your best for the Lord if you have taken the time to loosen the bow. You know, our, our workload is probably going to get pretty heavy this year. God willing, the year will be difficult again in many ways. All years seem to be difficult in many ways. We're soon going to see that our building start. And I guess that's exciting. I know many of us, we kind of hesitate to get excited because it's like we've kind of been on this track before. But it's, it's, even if it gets started, there's going to be, it's going to be burdensome. And we, we also have to know that, that there's certain people that are going to probably want to try to do more work than others, and they can't do this on their own. And we can't, not one of us can carry this on our own. We need each other, and we need Christ at the head. We also need rest. And to assure each other is getting rest. We need rest for our minds, bodies, and our souls. And hopefully in these next eight weeks we become better at resting in Christ. And, you know, I see that as, as literally resting. I know there's many that will say, well, we find our, our rest in Christ. Our Sabbath is in Christ. He fulfilled the Sabbath now. Yes. But we still, we still need to rest. And so there is a, there is a practical Sabbath keeping 
a literal Sabbath keeping that I believe needs to continue for us. And you know, society, our culture does not teach this. We, you know, seven seven days is seven days to get work done. If we had another day, we'd use that one too. We need, hopefully, in this eight weeks, we become better at understanding and better at resting because, uh, you know, we can really only fully work in our full potential if we're resting well. I don't think there's anybody that can work well when they're weary. And they are completely broken down. And that's what will happen. It will happen emotionally. It will happen physically, mentally, and spiritually. <laughs> Resting will be the key. And I think this will be profitable. So may we continue to come to him as he bids <coughs> us come. And he will give us rest. Fully, fully rely on him. This, this, it, it is an exciting year, I know. It's, we've been looking forward to this. I know. It feels burdensome too, I know. But this idea of rest needs to be fully a, a part of it. Or, you know, it, it, it will fall, it will break, we will break. So that's fully, foundationally, and fundamentally rely on him through all of this. And I, I, I believe that we will. Tomorrow is a new day, a new year, and may we be focused on rest. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We do thank you for, for the rest that you bring. And we know that it's more than just physical rest. We know it's, it's a rest for our souls. And we know also there's a, there's a coming rest in, the, in eternity that, that will fulfill all that we need. So Father, we also know we are still in this broken, fallen world where we wear out. Lord, help us to see that. And Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that, that has not Come to you in the way of salvation. Father calls her. Draws her. May your grace be upon them. Father, we, we ask that you turn their hearts to you that they may repent, turn from sin, and accept your salvation. Father, we thank you for all that you've done through Christ. And may we continue to celebrate his birth. As we go into this new year, Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. And we know that it's all in your hands anyhow, whether we think that way or not. Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together our next song this morning. Hark the Herald of Angels Sing, number 163.
Christ and the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and stood upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We have some people who are for the altar.
New Year is about here. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his shine face and his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go and serve your Lord.